our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The saving mystery we celebrate this night is the inauguration of the Church's life. I go to prepare a place for you, says our Lord in his Gospel, according to John. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will also come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That place is nothing other than our Lord's human nature, that nature which the Divine Word assumed in the, word, the womb of his Virgin Mother, now drawn fully into the divine life of the Triune God, as intimately as possible for any creature. The place, Christ's sacred humanity, is prepared. The Church is already constituted in her head. The divine life of the Blessed Trinity already courses through the sacred humanity of Jesus, where he now receives, in both his natures, the worship of all creation. The economy of our salvation wants only the sending of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost to draw us into that life which is already in him. And so, to anticipate the Church's year somewhat, this coming Sunday, traditionally called Dominica Expectationis, the Sunday of the Expectation, the Church's prayer in expectation of Pentecost will be that God send to us the Holy Ghost to comfort us and exalt us unto the place whither our Saviour Christ is gone before. In the Ascension, the Church is constituted in her head. It is a point worth dwelling on. Too often we think of the church in one of two ways, either as the building, the place where we go to church on Sundays, or as the assembly of believers. Now there is, of course, some truth in each of these, but both understandings of the church are fundamentally incomplete and on their own, misleading. The Church is the body of Christ. That is to say, the Church is the sacred humanity of the Divine Word, and the life of that sacred humanity is the very life of God. We are not members of the Church because we gather together here in this building or anywhere else nor is the Church constituted by any particular activity, not even by the worship of Almighty God, which is her first duty and her chief joy. Rather, we are members of the Church precisely because, in baptism we were made in Cranmer's words, very members in corporate and the mystical body of the Divine Son of God. For by one Spirit, says St. Paul, we were all baptized into one body. To be a member of the Church is to be a member of Christ's body. It is to receive our life from that body, just as the branches of a vine receive their life from the vine itself. I am the vine, says our Lord, ye are the branches. So the members of this parish, of this diocese, of this Anglican Church of Canada, of the entire Catholic Church throughout the world, are only members of the Church, insofar as they have become members of Christ's body. And we are members of that body in no metaphorical sense, but literally. Although to be sure we belong to it in a way that surpasses our power to conceive of it in any way adequate to itself. When we begin to understand this truth, however slightly, 
how small in comparison seem all other thoughts of what the church ought to be. For to be a member of the church is already to share in the divine life of the Son of God. In baptism we have died, as St. Paul tells us, and our life is now hid with Christ in God. God has made us alive together with Christ and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. When, therefore, we lift up our hearts in worship of the triune God, our worship is already, in some very real sense, the worship of heaven. Our worship is grounded in the self-ablation of the human nature of the divine Son of God, and that self-ablation, because it is the self-ablation of the Son's own humanity, is itself grounded in the eternal self-giving of the Son to the Father in their mutual love, which is the Holy Spirit. All this is accomplished for us in our Lord's ascension. In the ascension, the Church is constituted in Christ, her head, and we, his members, are drawn into the great mystery of the divine life. We are found in Christ, within the eternal relational unity that is the triune life of God. In the text from the epistle to the Philippians that I have just cited, St. Paul tells us that our conversation is in heaven. The Greek word that the authorized version translates as conversation has two meanings. Its most literal meaning is citizenship, which is how most contemporary translations render it. Now this is certainly true. By virtue of our baptism, our engrafting into the body of Christ, we do in some very real sense already dwell in heaven, in the one whose presence is heaven. Yet that word has a secondary meaning, which I think is also at play here. It can also mean the way or manner of life of the members of a particular city. So St. Paul is not only telling us that we now in some sense dwell in heaven, although we do, but also that because we dwell in heaven, our way of life here and now must be that of those who dwell in Christ. This is why we have prayed in our collect that we who believe in our Lord's ascension may also in heart and mind thither ascend into the heavens and with him continually dwell. We dwell in heaven already in Christ, our head, as members of his body. And so our conversation, our manner of life, is to be that of heaven. We must learn to live here and now in the messiness, the anxiety, the suffering, and the fear of this present life, as we hope to live for eternity in the loving contemplation of the one who is our first beginning and our true end. That is to say, we are called to begin to live here and now in the ever-deepening knowledge that we are, in some very true sense, already there in heaven, participants in the happy-making vision of God himself. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to whom we ascribe as is most justly due all might, majesty, dominion, and glory, henceforth and forever. Amen. <laughs>